right, so today I've decided that we're going to go through a, couple, a few verses found in the New Testament book of James. And I've titled today's message, Passing the Test of Trials. Passing the Test of Trials. In the passage, as you might have already noticed and that we'll be looking at today, the trials of life will be the main topic. Now, everybody has either faced some serious trials. I heard this morning uh, some uh, really some amazing stories of someone who just faced some trials, some pretty crazy trials in the past. And, um, but maybe you're going through a, a trial right now. Or maybe you see the dark clouds of trials in the horizon. And I know that in talking to some of the people here in our church, they are. They are facing trials or they see trials up ahead. And there is some concern there. And I know my heart goes out to them. Um, and I think everybody that does know, I'm sure their heart goes out to, to them as well. Um, but really, it's not uncommon, that, not uncommon that when trials arise, when they do approach or we're in the midst of trials, they often prompt groanings and complaints. How many of you have uttered that saying, why do bad things happen to good people? But as believers, as Christians, this kind of response doesn't contribute to Christian maturity. It really only makes matters worse. J.C. Ryle once said, there's nothing which shows our ignorance so much as our impatience under trouble. We forget that every cross is a message from God and intended, intended to do us good in the end. Trials are intended to make us think, to wean us from the world, to send us to the Bible, to drive us to our knees. Health is a good thing, but sickness is far better if it leads us to God. Prosperity is, a, is great mercy, but adversity is a greater one if it brings us to Christ. Anything, anything is better than living carelessness and dying in sin. Church, as we'll see, as we'll soon see, soon see, trials aren't to be seen as tribulations, but testings. Similar to the test that's, been, that's given to a student to see if a student can pass, not pass out. Well, today, James will give sound advice on how to score high on every test. He'll begin with telling us why it's important to have the right attitude to the trial and then inform us about the advantage of that trial. And then he'll cap off his advice by letting us know where to look to, where, do we, where to draw strength from. For those who have often found yourself failing or even passing out during trials, I listening and heeding to the advice that James will offer, I have no doubt that you'll certain, certainly end up in God's honor roll. Now, I've never really been a good student myself, never really in, during middle school, high school, was never in any kind of honor roll. I don't know what it's like. I didn't know what it's like until I went to Bible college and, and uh, I was able to do fairly good there and get on some kind of honor roll, but I enjoyed that. But maybe some of you aren't really, haven't really been good at taking tests. You know, well, here, again, James will show you that you can as a believer, as a Christian, 
as someone who has the Holy Spirit living in you, you can end up in God's honor roll by passing these, this test, test of trials. So before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask him to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, um, we are thankful again as Isaac prayed that you have us all here, that we are able to spend time worshiping you and adoring you and praising your name, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, for all he has done and all he will do, Lord. Lord, you have heard my prayers and the prayers of many in this church, all those that are and going through really difficult times, some serious trials in their lives. I pray this message will give them comfort, will give them joy if they're not feeling it already, Lord. Show us, all of us, what it is that we need to know, what we need to understand about trials, trials of life, the difficulties that are here, that will come, Lord. Show us the right response we ought to have towards them. If you want it, we seek you, Lord. We seek your wisdom. Open our hearts and minds now as we receive your word. Fill this room with your spirit. Speak to us now through your word. Pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So I'm going to pick up in verse 2 there. James chapter 1, verse 2. And the word of God says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that The testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So after giving his customary salutation, James begins to get right into the subject that is troubling his Christian readers the most, the trials of life. Now, it's important to first point out what James means by trials. The English translation of the Greek word trials is is temptation. But in this chapter here, James uses the word in two different senses. In verses 2 to 12, the the, the temptations are what we might call holy trials or problems that which are sent from God. Those are the outward trials, trials that we have no control over. These trials usually come through unexpected circumstances and are sent by God to test the reality of our faith and produce likeness to Christ. In verses 13 through 17, on the other hand, The subject is unholy temptations, which come from within and which lead to sin. Those are the inward temptations. So again, we have the outward temptations, we have the inward. Now in the context, it's being used here. Again, it's trials that are outwardly and come in different ways to different people. Now some deal with personal or family health problems. Maybe some of you watching and listening or maybe here have just recently lost your job. You were laid off. Maybe your car broke down and now you don't know how to get to work and you don't know how you're going to get to work. Some are dealing with some serious relationship problems that you had no really part of. Maybe your partner, your wife, your husband, you found out is cheating on you. Maybe they're going through a a really difficult time in their health, 
you know, everyone deals with these issues, these trials differently. Again, these trials are unpredictable in their coming and as, uh, in their coming as suggested by the adding of when, you're, when you experience, which, and I'm going to get a little technical here, which is an indefinite temporal clause. That word, when you experience, is an indefinite temporal clause. The clause simply means that they tend to come at an undetermined time and are inevitable. This is why he says there specifically. Now, again, if you read that verse, he says, this is, uh, he says when you experience, not if you experience. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is the attitude James says a Christian ought to have when experiencing those trials. Consider it great joy, he says. Not just joy, but great joy. Uh, yes, there are several possible attitudes we can take towards these testings and trials of life. We can rebel against them by adopting a spirit a spirit of defiance, boasting that we will battle through our victory, to our victory by our own power. In other words, I can handle this. I can deal with it. I, I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I don't need anybody. I'll get through it on my own. On the other hand, we can lose heart or give up under pressure. This is nothing but fatalism. It leads to questioning even the Lord's care for us. Again, we can grumble and complain about our troubles. This is what Paul warns us about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. And here's another option. We can indulge in self-pity, thinking of no one but ourselves, and then trying to get sympathy from others. But this here is what's better. What's better is we can let the difficulties and perplexities of life to strengthen our faith. We can basically say, God has allowed this trial to come to me. He has some good purpose in it for me because he's a good God. I don't know what that purpose is, but I'll try to find out. I want his purposes to be worked out in my life. Are those your thoughts? Are those your, is that your, essentially, what comes to mind when you're going through the difficulties and perplexities of life? Are you allowing it to strengthen your faith? This is what James is advocating by saying, consider it. Great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, don't rebel, don't faint, rejoice. Have great joy in those trials. These problems are not enemies bent on destroying you, and they shouldn't see, be seen as a punishment, a curse, or a calamity. There are friends which have come to aid you to develop Christian character and should be faced with an attitude of joy. Also keep in mind this, this is important also, that James didn't say a believer should be joyous for the trials but in the trials. Christian, born-again believer, God is trying to produce Christ's likeness in each and every one of his children. And this process necessarily involves suffering, frustration, and perplexity. You see, what God will send or allow as a trial to strengthen our faith, Satan will seek to exploit it 
to get us to sin. Conversely, what Satan throws our way as a temptation, God allows it, allows to be a trial. In other words, Satan wants to use the trial to tear us down and wipe us out. God wants to use the same event to show us how faithful he is and how real he can be. If you guys and gals have read the book of Job, you know exactly what that looks like. In the book of Job, we see Satan trying to wipe out, wipe Job out by afflicting him physically, causing him to lose his family, and ruining him financially. God was proving something else. God was showing how faithful he would be. As a result, all of history would marvel in studying how, in the midst of what Satan meant for evil, God used it for good as he sustained Job all the way through and ultimately rewarded him. Furthermore, also keep this in mind, that the fruit of the Spirit cannot be produced when all is sunshine, when all is bright and sunny. There must be rain and there must be dark clouds. I get it, I understand. Having been through many trials myself, they never seem pleasant, they don't feel good. Dude, they, they suck. I know, to be frank, that's how I feel when I'm going through them. They seem difficult. And we often just don't get it, we disagree, we're like, no. This can't be. But as I know, and as many of you also know, that afterwards they yield peaceable fruit, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by them. Friends, when a trial comes your way, Satan for sure will be there the same day to try to get you to do what Miss Job suggested her husband do, to curse God and die. Remember that? That's what she told her husband. Just curse God and die. How bad his life was. But Satan... Again, we'll do the same. Whisper that in your ear. Even when the worst news has come your way, he'll tell you, you know what? God doesn't love you. He doesn't care for you or else this would have happened to you. But the, tru the, the, the truth is, that's not the truth. It's furthest from the truth. He loves you and cares for you and you is using that trial to build you up, to bring you closer to him so you can draw from his strength, so you can understand and feel his mercy. And he wants to show you so many wonderful and great things. You can only see that when you're open to that, when you understand that. Again, I don't know a lot of your circumstances. I don't know a lot of what your trials are, what you're going through. Some of you I do. That's why we have these prayer cards that Isaac mentions in the beginning. We want to know what your, if you have any prayer requests. You can share them with us, and we will pray with you. You can do that anonymously. You could also do that on online if you're watching this. If you're in some kind of 
battlefield right now in some part of the world and you're going through these trials and you don't understand it, you can know that God has a plan. If you are currently in prison or in jail and somehow, some way, you're, you've stumbled across this message on audio form or video, God has a plan for your circumstance. Even if you're completely innocent and you didn't do nothing, and this is just, an, it's not justice. You haven't received any justice or you're, you're in jail for no reason. God knows, and he's trying to teach you something through that. But just know you're not alone. The Lord is there with you and wants to get you, wants to get through it with you. And don't allow Satan to lie to you. To tell you that he doesn't care for you. James then goes on to inform us in verses 3 and 4 about the advantage of the trial. In the ESV, verse 3 reads, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. In his book, Broken Things, M.R. Dehan wrote, A bar of steel worth $5 when made into, an, into ordinary horseshoes is worth $10. If this same $5 bar is, bar is manufactured into needles, the value rises to $350. And yet, if it's made into delicate springs for expensive watches, it's worth more than $250,000. The same bar of steel is made more valuable by being cut into its proper size pass through one blast furnace after another, again and again, hammered and manipulated, beaten and pounded, finished and polished, until it's ready for those delicate tasks. Church, like that bar of steel, when we face trial, our faith is being tested to reveal the quality of our faith and to produce spiritual stamina and to ready us for more delicate tasks. Trials, my friends, come to prove and improve us. Trials come to prove and improve us. Let me give you another example. A guy named Joe had been bench pressing the same weight for several months and was absolutely happy with that. One day after setting up some weights for a workout, he walked away to get a drink of water. And Joe wasn't looking, someone came and added additional weight to the bench press bar. When Joe returned, he proceeded as usual But as he begins, he immediately feels the added resistance. Not knowing what happened, Joe figures he just might be having a bad day, a bad workout day, and pushes himself to complete his sets. When he gets up, he wipes wipes off the sweat off his forehead, and he moves towards the weights in order to put them away. It's at that moment that Joe realizes the unexpected extra weight on the bar. At first, he's shocked and dismayed, but suddenly feels happy about it. A smile appears on his face because he realizes what had just occurred. Somebody knew that it was time for Joe to be pushed past his comfort zone and purposely added just enough weight so that he would struggle yet complete his sets. All Joe had to do was not give up. This other person testing him, this other person was testing him to see how committed he was to complete what he began. 
Not only did Joe endure and complete it, but he became stronger as a result. This was the idea that James was trying to convey. But even then, he wants us to understand that something else occurs when we choose to endure in our trials. Again, he says in verse 4, Let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Church, as you endure in these trials, the more maturity you will have in your walk, and the less you will lack in knowledge and wisdom. Patience, endurance, and the ability to keep going when things are tough is what God wants for our lives. That's what he wants for your life. In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Paul wrote this, We boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. In the Bible, patience or endurance is not a passive acceptance of circumstances. It's a courageous perseverance in the face of suffering and difficulty. Immature people, people who give up and or don't want to see any improvement, aren't looking for that improvement and that maturity in their walk and their faith. They're always impatient. Mature people are patient and persistent. Impatient and unbelief usually go together, just as faith and patience do. See, God wants to make us patient. He wants to make you patient because that's the key. That's the key, my friends, to every other blessing. The little child who does not learn patience will not learn much of anything else. For those of you who had children, that was a difficult task, right? Right? to teach them patience, to teach them, hold on, just wait. Be so quick. Take your time. It wasn't easy. And sometimes, it, it, and even as adults, we're still, learn, we're still learning how to, many of us are still learning how to be patient because we want things now, we want things to happen right away. You don't want to wait But again, someone who doesn't learn that patience will not learn much of anything else. When the believer learns to wait on the Lord, then that's when God can do great things for him or her. Abraham ran ahead of the Lord, married Hagar, and brought great sorrow into his home. Stories in Genesis 16. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses ran ahead of God, murdered a man, and had to spend 40 years with a sheep to learn patience. Peter, in John chapter 18, almost killed a man in his impatience. The only way the Lord can develop patience and character in our lives is through trials. Whatever that trial may be, that's the only way the Lord can develop patience and character in you. Endurance cannot be attained by reading a book, listening to a sermon, or even praying a prayer. We must go through difficulties, the difficulties of life, trust God, and obey Him. 
doing that, by doing, by having, by, by allowing, by going through those difficulties, trusting God and obeying him, the result will be patience and character. Knowing this, when you know this, you can face trials joyfully. We know that trials will do this for us, will do this in us and for us. And we know that the end result, the end result of it all, after you've gone through that trial, it will bring glory to God. You will give him all the credit. He will get all the glory for allowing you to for helping you get through that trial. This fact explains why studying the Bible helps us grow in patience. As we read about Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, and even our Lord, we realize that God has a purpose for our trials. God fulfills his purpose as we trust him. There is no substitute for an understanding mind. Satan can defeat the ignorant believer, but he cannot overcome the Christian who knows his Bible and understands the purposes of God. Now, in the next few verses... James jumps, jumps into a few other subjects and, and uh, a few things that, I, because of time, I can't really get into at the moment. But um, I want to just jump down to one more verse that will close out our message today. So it'll be down in, cha- in verse 12. James chapter 1, verse 12. There it says, blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In concluding his discussion of holy trials, James pronounces a blessing on a person who stands up, who stands up under affliction. James tells us that when someone had stood the test or remained steadfast under trial, he or she and she will receive the crown of life. Now, to be sure, to be clear, the crown here isn't an actual king's crown with all the jewels and, you know, what you may see in books or on TV and the movies. But what he's talking about here is the victor's wreath that will be awarded to believers at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, there's no suggestion, of course, that eternal life is the reward for enduring testings. But those who have endured with fortitude will be honored for that kind of life and will enjoy a deeper appreciation of eternal life in heaven. Everyone's cup will be full in heaven, but people will have defined sized cups, different capacities for enjoying heaven. This is probably what's in view in the expression crown of life. It refers to a fuller enjoyment of the glories of heaven. And so as I start to close the message here, I want to briefly again look back at this passage and cover some things, re-examine some things real quick. If you want to pass the test of trials, James has given us two important ways to pass that test and not pass out during those tests of uh, those trials. 
Number one, as difficult as they may seem at the moment, it's important to have the right attitude to those trials. You know, in addition to what he told us in verses 2 and 3, Peter also said this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal when the fire ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you also may rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. The second sound advice he gave to pass the test of, uh, of trials is to understand the advantage of trials. When we endure trials, God is shaping us, is shaping you into the image of Christ. He's making you more and more to the image of Christ. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let me also add this third point here, this third lesson. There is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing that can replace the love, wisdom, and knowledge that God wants to reveal to you in his trials. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then are we to say about those things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded in neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Nothing. Nothing at all will be able to separate, separate you from God's love. Don't allow the enemy to lie to you and tell you because of what you're going through physically, because of what's going on with your health, because of your financial situation, because of your home situation, your personal life. Don't allow those trials to keep you from the love that God wants to give you and the love that he wants you to experience. My friends, he understands, he knows whatever trial, whatever it is that, you know, 
whatever it is you're going through right now. And even if you're not going through anything right now, again, it will come when they come. Keep that, those things in mind. Keep that in mind. Rejoice. There's a way you can, it does, where you can still rejoice even though it doesn't feel good. To know that, to rejoice in knowing that your life is in the hands of the creator of this universe. In the hands of him who gave his son to die for your sins, to forgive you of all your sins, who raised Jesus from the dead. He'll never leave you, nor forsake you, my friend. And if you're on your deathbed, you can still rejoice in knowing that He loves you and He's with you. Some of you, again, have forgotten about that. And going through some really difficult, hard times right now. I hope this message reminded you don't allow these trials, these difficulties to upset you, to move you, to change the direction, to change you from the path that God has for you. And if it has already and it has for a long time, it's never too late to come back to that straight, narrow road. So come to him. Come to the cross. Ask him to forgive you. And he will. Some of you are looking for that joy. Some of you uh, haven't had it and don't know. Maybe, again, things are horrible at home. Yeah, your home life is just, it's not your fault, but these things are bad. Your mom, your dad, maybe, again, they're making decisions that really hurt you. And you're wondering, what should I do? I'm telling you, you can come to Christ and he can give you the strength to keep going. Some of you, again, don't know, don't understand, don't get it, but you can. If you just allow the Holy Spirit to come make his home in you. That begins by surrendering your heart, allowing Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. By saying, you know what, I'm done being the God of my own life. I'm done trying to take control of my situation, my circumstances, and I'm just going to trust in my Savior, in the Savior who died for me. So if you want that forgiveness, if you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want to understand that joy during trials, if you want to pass the test of trials, and not pass out, not fail, I invite you to the cross. If you've never received Jesus into your heart and are ready to do that this morning, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head as I lead you in this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. 
Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me all the way with Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and encourage me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, reach out to us. You want to hear about it. You want to help you in your next steps. If you're going through really difficult trials, a difficult trial or circumstance, let us know so we can pray about you. There is a, a section in our website, uh, uh, an area in our website. You can send us those, send me those prayer requests, and I will definitely be praying for them. But uh, help this message encouraged those of you, many of you. I hope and pray that this upcoming week the Lord will continue to encourage you and to love you and provide his mercy. Have a great week. Have a blessed week. Bless others. Goodbye. I love you. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.